I'm joined now by Michael Klein, an analyst focusing on issues in Africa. And I want to get your reaction to this report by Amnesty International, because it is getting a, a bit of press, isn't it? Yeah, it's thankfully um, drawing attention back to Darfur and Sudan, uh, something that was a one of the first rallying cries of the Internet age, really drew public attention uh, to the Save Darfur campaign, led the International Criminal Court to its first indictment of a sitting head of state and one of the world's largest peacekeeping missions. But flash forward about uh, 13 years, public attention has been uh, diverted um, in some ways. Uh, the ICC, International Criminal Court, hasn't been able to bring Bashir in, and even the peacekeeping mission is being drawn down to pick up other conflicts in the world. What about monitoring this region? Is it difficult to do, do so? I mean, uh, talk to us a little bit about it. This is a very remote region in central Darfur, um, and the amnesty report was done remotely because uh, they, they do not have access themselves to it for a few reasons. Uh, number one, it's very insecure. There are aerial bombardments. It's very remote, no infrastructure, and the government restricts access to a very few amount of people. So they're going to need to get both investigators in there um, to ascertain whether this, uh, these allegations are really true uh, with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, as well as reintroduce uh, UN peacekeepers if uh, there's going to be progress. You mentioned attention span. It seems like we all, our attention span shifts. Uh, of course, the Syria crisis has really dominated the news, the migrant crisis, and, and this has kind of been left out. Is there enough being done uh, on the international stage, and what more can be done when it comes to Darfur? Well, that's right. I, I hate to think that public consciousness is a zero-sum game, but I think there is some reckoning there between ongoing conflicts in Sudan and other places in Africa, Syria, Yemen, other parts of the world, uh, that have seen a proliferation in the, over the past decade. Just like the Save Darfur campaign 13 years ago was rooted in uh, public awareness, I think it's going to take that again to mobilize um, the international community, uh, drive some AU member or African nations to pursue uh, Bashir, which saw public opinion turning in that direction somewhat in South Africa after they let him get away and also to um, uh, uh, push the UN Security Council conversation, which actually just took place today, where Sudan is trying to boast that the Darfur conflict is, out of, is under control um, with some iterant ceasefires that really don't mean much on the ground, and that therefore they deserve to draw down uh, peacekeeping troops and take over security themselves. You brought it up, Bashir, a sitting president, uh, two arrest warrants out for him, and yet nothing's happened. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and why? It shows the rather impotence of the International Criminal Court in a region where, uh, for maybe some obvious reasons, a lot of states have not signed on to the uh, Rome Convention that uh, implements its indictments. Um, there is some um, optimism that even though he got away in South Africa, um, a South African group successfully sued the government um, to uh, decry that ex post facto as an illegal, that they did not arrest him. Um, but it's going to take more buy-in from African states if he's ever going to be brought to justice in Europe. Yeah, I heard the word optimism thrown out there. Are, are you optimistic about the future for Darfur? Or, or what are your thoughts? I mean, we've seen this language for so long. What needs to happen? I think if we remember that just because we turn away from something, just because there's not video on uh, the television um, or the news, that something doesn't stop happening. And that's what's needed. Well, Michael, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks for bringing attention to this issue. Michael, you mentioned Somalia, and these are the words that were used to describe it for decades. Famine, civil war, Black Hawk Down, failed state, al-Shabaab. So what does this mean for this country that has been defined by so many negative words for decades to pull off a summit like this? Yeah, I think images of war-torn Somalia are slightly outdated. If you were to see daily life in Mogadishu, the capital today, you would see bustling markets and bounding construction, uh, funded in part by returning diaspora, partially by foreign countries. Um, we'll have to speak about both threats and promises, but I think on balance, the EGAD summit today, followed by uh, elections uh, later this month and in October, uh, should sound an optimistic note for Somalia and its people. Well, kind of riffing off of that, uh, the foreign affairs minister noted uh, this quote, uh, this is the first time Somalia hosts such a high-level summit in 30 years. We see it as a historic signal and message to the world 
that Somalia is coming back. Is it really coming back, or is it still fragile? Well, it's certainly a pivotal and historic moment for Somalia, but not to dispense with the optimism too quickly, but it faces a number of uh, serious threats, uh, particularly outside the capital, um, and chief among them is security. That's the reason, for instance, that today's summit was only held in the green zone uh, near Mogadishu's airport, because, and there were still reports of uh, gunfire in other parts of the capital. The chief threat comes from al-Shabaab, uh, which technically retreated from Mogadishu back in 2011, but simply shifted from uh, conventional warfare tactics to guerrilla warfare targeting the African Union, which went from being peacekeepers in Somalia to targets themselves to symbols of daily life. Well, how does the country turn the corner? Well, there's um, a number of challenges that Somalia faces. I'd say uh, there are three chief among them. Uh, firstly, security. We talked about they're going to have to bring security not just to the capital, but nationwide uh, to defeat al-Shabaab and strengthen a Somali national military to eventually take over that responsibility from the African Union. Second is politically. Um, these elections are not the finish line. They're just a hurdle in Somalia's political development. They have to see if they can bring former warlords um, and tribal leaders into the political process. There has to be respect for um, a civilian government. For instance, will President Hassan step down if he loses the election? Um, and uh, those will have to go peacefully. Now, they're not being held nationwide. There's only about 14,000 designated voters because that would be too dangerous otherwise. And uh, lastly, economic. Uh, rebuilding Somalia is going to take a lot of investment and patience. Some of that will come from returning diaspora. Others will come from foreign countries looking to cash in on that peace dividend now that security improves um, in uh, the heart of the country. Turkey has become a very important economic partner looking to cash in on that dividend in ways that China um, is looking for its returns in formerly war-torn countries such as DRC and Sudan proper. Michael Klein with Analysis Force. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Mike. For more on the rather complicated situation in South Sudan, we're joined by Michael Klein. He's an international security expert who focuses on Africa. Uh, Michael, before I get to the arms embargo, I want to talk about these brutal attacks we've seen against UN diplomats, peacekeepers, international aid workers. What is going on in South Sudan? Why so much hostility against outsiders? South Sudan, a country that's known almost nothing but war for its existence both since and before independence, has to be one of the most difficult and challenging places in the world for peacekeepers to operate. Um, people there know, like I said, little, but being in a state of conflict, there's no infrastructure. And lately, uh, peacekeepers and foreigners have become a uh, target um, themselves. This has been happening increasingly since over the summer when the last iterant ceasefire fell apart, particularly the capital Juba fell into disarray. Since then, uh, they've become targets themselves as well as the foreign aid community. And that spells a very troubling uh, situation for a country in such disarray as South Sudan. And how much does that disarray, the strife that we're seeing in South Sudan, how much is that translating into this, this, these attacks that we're seeing against foreigners? Yeah, we've seen everything from uh, foreigners and peacekeepers being targets of violence themselves to being denied medical care. And it is, I believe, a, a, an elite strategy coming from uh, the top of the Sudanese, South Sudanese political structure, which has uh, commandeered this uh, perpetual conflict into an elite struggle between two factions, that of the president, Salva Kiir, and his nemesis, uh, a man by the name of Rik Machar. While Rik Machar is out of the country and Kiir is trying to consolidate power, he has found some utility in scapegoating and uh, stimming uh, further peacekeeping or UN efforts. And what about thousands of displaced civilians? What is life like for them? It's millions, really, because it's, and it's been going on for uh, decades, not just since 2013. Uh, they are living both within South Sudan in dire conditions and in refugee camps in Uganda that are saturated to levels that we're used to really only seeing in the Middle East. Uh, you have an economy that is in complete collapse. 90% of the government revenue comes from oil, 
Well, with the drop in oil price uh, earlier this year and the force majeure of oil companies in South Sudan, that's been completely depleted, depleted the country of foreign reserves uh, with inflation skyrocketing to over 700 percent. Currency is virtually worthless, commodities, even food, unaffordable. And the South Sudanese population uh, really sees themselves again as a pawn among this uh, conflict of the elites of their uh, young uh, country. Young country indeed, but so many problems. Michael Klein, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. By Michael Klein, he's an analyst focusing on issues in Africa. Uh, Gambia's uh, decision considered a big blow to the court in the sense that the chief prosecutor actually comes from Gambia. Talk to us about the significance of this move. Right, Mike. Gambia is actually the third of the latest countries to withdraw or signal their withdrawing from the International Criminal Court in Africa, a continent that has the most conflicts in the world and arguably the least capable and impartial judicial space. That's an intersection that the court was intended to address in the first place. The larger or longer term problem is this, this in fact, signals an exodus. Um, in this troubled region because the court can only operate within its member states. So it shrinks not only its stature, uh, but also its jurisdiction. So are we going to see an exodus? Because Kenya and Namibia also uh, talking about taking similar steps as well as uh, Uganda. And uh, Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Burundi and Gambia are countries that have their own legal shortcomings and allegations of high-level political crimes that the court was supposed to address. The real problem is South Africa, which has more developed democratic institutions signaling they're going to withdraw, possibly providing cover for African neighbors uh, as they make a play to be a leader in the region. Uh, the Gambian government statement said that the court unfairly targeted African leaders. The court is supposed to target leaders. We would think it were unfair if it were only targeting uh, low-level officials. It's not supposed to primarily target Africans. And that's a problem that has been rumbling on the continent and that the court uh, had foreseen uh, for some time. Michael Klein is a senior analyst for Drum Cusack, the firm specializing in risk assessment. How much is fact and how much is fiction? Suicide bombings have increased in the past month because Boko Haram is shifting to more traditional terrorist tactics as they've been routed out of the territory that they held by the counterinsurgency. As they do that, they uh, shift towards suicide bombings and ambushes. It's true that a lot of these suicide bombings are reported to be young girls. That's been a really troubling legacy of the Chibok, um kidnapping. Is this a case where Boko Haram is that strong? or Nigeria is just that weak? I think the key word here is strategy. Boko Haram has a strategy. It's been portrayed as a ragtag group of gunmen, but they are very adaptable. The question is, does the government have a strategy? The colossus of the Nigerian government, not adaptable. They haven't been able to adapt their conventional warfare approach to the asymmetric and uh, terroristic suicide bombings and attacks that Boko Haram can uh, uh, use as it shifts into the It is a sign that maybe they have not been as decimated as people thought. There are three at least real reasons why we see the sudden escalation. One is that there's a new president in town and they want to hit him hard before he can stand up. Two, they've adapted their strategy um, to the conventional counterinsurgency um, techniques of uh, the government to uh, retreat from holding territory towards more asymmetric warfare that relies on sleeper terrorist cells, more in the, more, the model of Al-Qaeda. The third uh, reason is that we're in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan, and that is actually an ISIL process. Okay, so what are the implications of his win on Nigeria's two militant movements, Boko Haram in the north, and the Niger Delta media uh, militancy in the South. Right, so the, Nigeria basically has two historic militant movements. One everyone knows about right now is Boko Haram, that's which is raging in the northeast of the country, um, the region uh, where Bahari himself is from. And there's also a latent Niger Delta militancy, which people might remember more from the early 2000s. A lot of the disbanded militant groups uh, in the south have threatened to take to the streets or produce more unrest or violence um, in protest of Bahari's candidacy. But I think ultimately we believe that the leaders of those militant groups will be waiting to see what concessions they can get from a new Bihari administration um, before making more attacks. After all, the president that originally took the 
brought the Niger Delta militancy under control was the former President Yardwa, who was a Muslim from the same northern region as Buhari. Defeat an incumbent. So what does that say about Nigeria's population, its voters, and, and how their views may have changed dramatically? And, and how has he been able to shed his past as a military ruler? It's a major sign of Nigeria's uh, maturity as a democracy, um, how far it's come just from 1997 when multi-party elections began. Like I said, I think the greatest impact that Buhari has had so far was his election. It's it, his election did more to instill confidence and unite the country than probably anything in the past 18 years. Uh, Nigeria is an extraordinarily young country. Seventy percent of its population is under the age of 30. So uh, starting or getting off on the right foot now in 2015 could mean a lot for its own political development. The influence um, is going to stay the same. In fact, it's spreading just from the economic model that I was just alluding to, to political, uh, where China is getting involved in building political capacity with African nations to security and, and being involved in peacekeeping operations. Um, but it is, go and, and in those instances, actually, you see somewhat that it's a two-way um, uh, influence, although it's heavily weighted on one end. Uh, you see China, uh, you know, delving into um, certain doctrines that it would never explore um, internally or in the Asian sphere. As we see certain African countries who have grown commodity dependent on their relationship with China really crash economically. But there's still a lot of um, room to uh, be made in terms of major infrastructure development projects like this in, uh, information superhighway. And that still has um, some very positive influence potential um, with driving wages and uh, capacity and kind of higher value investment up in Africa itself. Michael Klein joining us from New York City. Thank you.